come from Chairman O'Malley yet to tell, although I am appreciative of everything that he has done, didn't come from the Black Panthers or any of the other organizations that we hear about, but it came from within the rooms behind the wall of Rita and another organization that they worked with at that time years ago called African Echoes. And they would, they would have these talks and invite some of the most brilliant revolutionaries around. And I was some younger, I don't even know how I wound up at one of these, um, these uh, productions that they had, one of these forums that they had. But I did. And I was just young. I didn't know nothing. I couldn't contribute to any conversation or anything like that. But what I did was crucial. I just showed up. And I would allow these ideas, these things that people were talking about to enter into my headspace. And I remember the first time I ever heard that I am an African, it came from within the walls of Rebound at that time when working with African Echoes. But I remembered, um, I was told, and Brother Carl might tell a little bit about this, they kept being put out of the places that they were renting from, because they were talking all this revolutionary stuff. You know, they had Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Clark, and all of these people. And you have, when you're renting from other places, you got to talk a certain way, because nobody really wants to hear that black stuff. I remember Brother Kyle was like, no, we have to have a place of our own. We have to have a place where we can be fully African, where we can be truly who we are. We don't have to answer to no one. And he had the vision and also another comrade who had such great respect for uh, the Uhuru movement. And he transitioned last year, Brother Aminifu Williams. In fact, he put a lot of the artwork in this room. And, it was also his vision and the vision of other people with Reefal. In fact, I don't the other members of Reefal, please stand up. Have this vision to build this place. And so much, there's been so many revolutionary meetings, so much work. This is like a think tank for the African uh, revolutionary struggle. And Brother Kai, I want to invite you up to uh, give a welcome. And again, I'm going to ask people to be disciplined. We have I hate time limits, but we have to utilize them. So, Brother Cobb, you would come up for five minutes and do what you do. And thank you. Please be mindful to put your phones on silent, and there will be no recording. You ask no recorded, and put your phones on silent so you know not interrupt about the speaker when he's speaking by your phone going off. Oh, please, thank you very much. Mm. Hotel. That means I come off in peace and satisfaction to use my ancient Kemet words. This, um, I just want to turn this off. My phone got some hellfire rings on. <laughs> just to um, go on with what Lisa was saying. We come out of African Echoes back in the 80s. Mm. What happened was, being African Echoes, we got thrown out of three churches. Mm. And when we got thrown out of three churches, because we brought in Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, who I was a personal bodyguard, you know, for she, we brought in basically everybody. But what happens is, once you start speaking the African truth through history and culture, our own people can't take it because every church is black. The only place we was allowed to stay was in Church of Illumination. That was the last one because I used to go to the school, so during the true school in East Orange, and talk for free to the students every month. And her father happened to be a preacher. But what happened, I told Brother Noonie, just to go with what he was saying, by the time we was getting thrown out that second church, I said, I can't be with no people, we don't get on home. We got to get home, so I just passed around a man in his job. And that mandated job group to we actually were able to buy this and buy the, the corner house. <clears throat> and this wasn't just like this. We basically built this ourselves and we're looking to expand it. And so what that taught me was a lot. That if you don't have your own place, you really don't have one. And what it gave me too was to really respect 
the black is back chairman's um because I know about them, they've been here before, but they have the place, they have the store, they have things. And in this world, I don't care how much demonstration you're doing, these people coming in buying everything and we ain't buying nothing. And so when we talk about cooperative economics, we have to see how we're gonna crop up, buy things. We used to do bee farming back here and draw our own honey. We're looking to buy the lot, come through it down, where we can not just do organic farming. What we want to do is aquaponics farming, where we can farm year round. This summer and last summer, we had other organizations come here and work with us in the summer program. We do free programs. We get ready to do a free after school program with brand new computers, everything in here coming up in a week or so. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, I don't even have to tell our people anything about African history and culture. Once they come to this room, they see it. They feel it. You go in here, we have our own library. <clears throat> now, things are a little bit different than it used to be with African Africans. I'm not so much into the speakers anymore because what I found is that the speakers become institutions, they don't build institutions. Mm -hmm. And our people take to them like it's an entertainment. And so if you see that post I did over there with the singers, take a chance and get to read it. Singers hit the high note, the speakers drop it. I got about 10 things on there. So, and I realized this, when I, I know a lot of these speakers personally, from, from Professor Griff on down, or on up. And they, what they say in front of you is what they're going to do when they ain't in front of you. And what they're going to do for our people. We got a lot of people that like to talk. I'm not so much into talking. The first thing we had in here is sounds a lot of talk. With Brother Armin there, we did that African martial arts. That was it. They was in here for years just doing that. Then we expanded to let other people in to do whatever. I don't care what somebody's belief is as long as you for the help of our people. That's the bottom line for me. Now, I look at the world a little bit different than some people do. I got some gift cards here I want to give away. I got five of them here for $20. We're going to be giving away about two to three thousand dollars throughout the course of the next two weeks. Now, I like to know. Most of us say we suffer from white supremacy, right? Do everybody yes, agree with that? Yes, okay. sir. I do not call it that. And I tell you, how are you going to beat white supremacy? Can somebody tell me? No. How? <laughs> if a person. Yeah. Yeah, but the revolution has to be in your mind. It's not, there's no such thing as white supremacy. When they don't like you, it's white insanity we under. It's white madness we under. And what happens is if you don't actually come up with the right thing in your mind, you can never win. Because supremacy comes from what? Supreme means God. So how can a person treat you a certain way? You equate that with God. Am I right or wrong? I don't care if it's black supremacy, something's wrong with that. So until we learn to actually really critically think about the words and phrases we use, we'll never get out of this position. Never. And until you actually learn when you play chess or you box and do a thing, until you can put them on the defense with your words, how are you going to win? Because you always on the defense. Am I right or wrong? Mm -hmm. So all the phrases that we've been using, and that phrase came from a little old white farmer, not Francis Cress Wilson years ago, that we've been using, you can't let him define your reality for you. Does that make sense? All of us in here, most of us grew up. We've been together since the late 80s. We've been together since the 90s, 91, 30 something years. We was real young back then. Refill stands for Reconstruction Economics for African Love. Without love in the equation, nothing works. Do you understand? Nothing works. And so what happens is we have lost the feeling of love of community. I tell people all the time, when you come in here and see that poster, Whose timeline are you on? That will exactly tell you and tell me exactly where your mind is, where your culture is, wherever you believe is on that timeline. Because if you don't, who the first people on the planet? I believe it. Does anybody know how long we might have been on the planet? It's only going to take a minute and I'm done. You can see it, it's right up there. You, it's, it's right up there. No 4.5 million years. 5 million years. Yeah. Well, here, brother, here's one for you. It says it's five. all simple. It's no, all simple. I donate it back. I donate it back to y'all. Okay. Yeah, you. yeah. Yeah. It's all good. Now, the reason I say that, you know, you know, you know, now, the reason I say that, when you don't, if all you know is what they teach you to from Greece on up, yeah. that means 
your mind is blank on back. So how can you be yourself if you don't know yourself? Am I right? That's right. And That's if you right. can't know yourself, any good doctor, psychiatrist is going to tell you what? You either going or you out of your mind. That's our people today. That's why we got people want to be black Barbies and black Kens. You know what I'm talking about. You see it all the time. Because we have lost our way and we let other people what? Miseducate us in every field there is. Am I right or wrong? You're right. And so what I'm saying is that we have to come take it back. Teaching in their institutions, this means that you're basically teaching what they're going to let you teach anyway. We have to build our own institutions for freedom. This brother should be able to go wherever he's going to get what he needs to do. Whatever we can do for you, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. I made it so with Lisa, guess what? I told Lisa there's a certain child after that, he can stay all night. He can talk as long as he wants. He can do what he want as long as people hear because whatever message he got to give, the good thing about having your own place, you can stretch out here. You can do it because you can't rush a brother that's doing the right thing. That's right. And, right. and a lot of things ain't worth a lot of money. This is what? Priceless. That's right. This is priceless. That's right. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. And once we realize that there are certain people that are priceless, what is it worth? What is it worth? What is your time worth? You know, we looking for new members that actually say, who want to do the work? He's looking for people that want to do the work. Because that's what it takes. It's going to take work. You know, and that's how I judge people. Are you willing to do the work? Not what you're willing to shout about or this and that about. You know, at the end of the day, when you have a fight, you know what we used to say? Stop talking. You going to do something? Right. Am I right or wrong? Right. It, it, it's, a, it's a simple thing. Just stop talking. <laughs> either either we're going to get this on or we ain't. Or we ain't. And so people don't realize that's what we are. We're going to get this on or we not. Now, I, I like to thank everybody. You know, and this is, isn't my day. This is the chairman on my day. And if there's anything I can do for anybody here, I would like to. I'd like to thank Lisa. We need to give her a round for actually. <laughs> Right, she said when she came. Most of our people, even when we right here, they were scared to come in the doors here when we first came here. Because when you wear African wardrobe and you do this and that, they wonder first of all if you're a Muslim or you're something else. Our people live in fear. That's how they run in the world through fear. And they have us. The biggest fear they have of African people, African people are afraid to be African. Mm. That's the biggest fear worldwide. African, I don't care if you go on the continent. African people are afraid to be African. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's the main thing. They done took away our culture, and they done actually what we placed it with something else that's not us. That's not us. So most of us, whenever we quoting something, we're not quoting the original text. We quote some other text that they've been handed down to you. Because some of us are even afraid right in this room to learn and to relearn and to keep learning and to keep doing it. Because after we learn it, what we got to what change our ways. Am I right or wrong? You know. So on, on that note, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I just thank you for the time that you gave me. Uh, next, we're going to look at a couple of very important videos because I think it's really important for people to understand and to know, not just know what happened, but understand a little bit more about the work and um, the vision of the African People's Socialist Party in the movement. And of course, we know there are so many of us on the front line doing work, people doing great work in this room. I've had the opportunity to work among so many of you. But um, there was a real strategic reason behind that attack, and we need to understand it. I want to just, first of all, try to explain a little bit about the Uhuru movement. I'm sure, Chairman, I'm not going to get it all right. Because <laughs> um, the African People's Socialist Party has been in existence. He is the founder, or one of the founders of the African People's Socialist Party. He's been doing the work for the last 50 years, and probably longer, but not just under the African People's Socialist Party. And the Uhuru movement, at least most of the organizations that I know, consists of several organizations. One of them, you know, I would say the, the premier organ, medium organ, one, the African People's Socialist Party, which is 
Chairman O'Malley is just telling will explain that more to you, but that's like the Vanguard Party, the party he's always saying that it is their profession to be revolution and to take up, I mean to be revolutionaries and to take up the charge. They also have the International Democratic, the International Democratic People's Uhuru Movement. And that is the mass organization that supports the work of the African People's Socialist Party. And I've heard the chairman speak and say, you know, not everybody can always, they don't always have the space, they don't always have the headspace, they don't always have the time. They might not be quite there yet to commit to the revolutionary struggle, like full time, but they care. And maybe they might commit to police brutality and stopping that, so they have the mass organization um, in Pidong. The chairman also, um, with others I know, I have to give um, a shout out to our brother Glenn Ford, because I know that Chairman O'Malley and Chitella and others, including Glenn Ford, worked really hard to form the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, which is an organization, a coalition of organizations. All the organizations maintain their individual you know, identity and mission but we unite around certain principles and certain principles of unity, and definitely that is to um, advance the liberation of African people. And again, the full name of the Black and Black Coalition is the Black and Black Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. You see uh, Penny Hesh here. She is with the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Um, the president of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is actually. For the chair? Right, 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 right. She is um, works under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. Chairman Omali Eshitala was the one who founded the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And again, anything that I say in error or whatever, don't blame it on my part. It's just because I can't keep things straight. But I know that um, the charge is for people of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement to organize white people in their community and to organize around the righteous stance of ending this barbaric colonialist system of rejecting that horrible legacy to which they were born into, a legacy of blood and colonialism and destruction. And they organize around reparations. And uh, we should know that on um, in that scurrilous indictment that um, Penny Hess was alluded to. They don't actually name people, but they call them unindicted co-conspirators, and they talk a lot about the work that they're doing. And it was just absolutely scurrilous and a rag and just really pathetic because it wasn't based on any truth at all. But she's one of the people that is named as one of the unindicted co-conspirators. And so I wanted to just give a little bit of that breakdown in terms of the Uhuru movement and the African People's Socialist Party. And now we are going to just look at a couple of videos. It won't be that long, but it will give you a little bit more of an idea about what happened and then just some of the work they're doing. And I just want to also just say this. Um, I came to know the chairman more to work with the Black and Black Coalition in around 2012, I think. And I remember when Mike Brown was gone down and his body was left in the middle of uh, Ferguson. And I remember that time that the Black and Black Coalition, we were about to have um, um, a conference, maybe within a week or so after that happened. And I remember it saying, oh my gosh, I got to call Chairman Amali F. Chitala. One of the things I was thinking of, I could call him because I know he knows people here, you know, in California, all over. And I said, I got to call, because we got to do something. And when I reached out to his office, I found out that he was already in Ferguson. I'm like, okay, that's fast. And then, literally, literally, because I think, I think the conference that the Black and Black Coalition was having was when, in a week of when Mike Brown was murdered. And so I'm like, oh gosh, well maybe we can do some more outreach or whatever. I get to Philadelphia, we were having it in Philadelphia, and he had people from St. Louis or from the Ferguson area in that room with us who had never left. And one of them be eventually would become the uh, president of the International People's Democratic Rural Movement, and that's Sister Kalamayi and Danette. And then there were other organizations as well, like Brothers Akiba Rudy was there, and I was like, 
Wow. And then the next year, we had the conference in 2015 in St. Louis. And I think we had to rent somebody's space or whatever like that. I remember it was some kind of auditorium or something we had it in. But within about two years after that, the next time we had the convention, it was in the Uhuru House, which they built, renovated buildings. And I mean, and I've been seeing this. I've been, they talk about the Black Power Blueprint. I've been seeing how the chairman has the ability to concretize his ideas. We talked about um, in 2000, and I'm mentioning this because one of the things that is mentioned in that scarlet indictment is uh, some of the campaigns that the African People's Socialist Party was working on. And I remember in 2016, I think it was, the Black is Back Coalition established the um, Black is Back uh, Campaign School. Uh, Black is Back Coalition Campaign School in which our mission was we are going to run revolutionary politics. We're going to introduce it into the campaign, and we're going to run candidates based on revolutionary principles, and we're going to do it. And so we established this school. That year, uh, people in St. Petersburg decided to run two candidates, one of them Jesse Neville right here, and Sister Akile Anai, and you guys have probably already seen some of her videos. She is a very powerful, brilliant young woman, and they were organizing it around reparations. Prior to this, you never heard the word reparations even ever mentioned in a campaign. They were so successful in what they did that um, you may have heard um, a statement that was made when some fool, some idiot, but it was still a gift, made the statement, you all already got your reparations. Barack Obama is the reason you have your reparations. <laughs> yeah. And then he said, why don't you go back on the next flight to Africa? Something like that, he said. But that was a comment. That was a statement that was heard around the world. And that happened because of the work of the African People's Socialist Party and the campaign that uh, brother, uh, that Jesse Neville and that sister Akili ran. And they were in the the streets organizing. I turned on one video and I saw white people, these white kids are, yeah, reparations, reparations. They were on the streets in St. Petersburg doing that. And they were also so affected that Barack Obama came down into St. Petersburg to endorse the candidate they were running against. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a little bit of that history, but that is also very significant because the issue of, uh, one of the issues that was really um, mentioned in that scurrilous uh, indictment was that the Russians were paying people to do this and they were uh, running these propaganda campaigns because the Russians were just trying to cause all this dissension and they also said that and the Russians told the African People's Socialist Party, the chairman, like, like they ran another campaign, um, African charge genocide around reparations, they're like, he did that because they were told to do that. It's really scurrilous and condescending, but anyway, enough about that and about liberation. I'm going to now show some videos here. So let me pull out my little, my little toys. And um, let me just see if this should work. I'm going to move it in with you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, we're going to need you to hit the light.
And this was the speaker was working on the trident.
understand or, or articulate about the world without the chairman's leadership and political education and science, as I said, that he has given us as well. And I want to salute the African People's Socialist Party, our leadership. I want to salute Deputy Chair Omizene Shatella, who you saw in the video there, the coordinator of the, uh, of, of the Black Power Blueprint program and more than 60 economic, political economic institutions of the African People's Socialist Party that have been built over the last 50 years of struggle. And, you know, to say that on, on July 29th of this year, the FBI raided, as, as we saw, uh, very violently, very, very viciously uh, raided the home of Chairman Omali Chatella and Deputy Chair Onisene Chatella and two offices in two states, in Florida and Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, at the same time, 6 a.m. on the East Coast and 5 a.m. on the Central Time, um, breaking down doors, coming into four homes of leaders of the Uhuru movement, breaking down doors, and, and in particular, when they came and assaulted the home of Chairman Omali Chattel and Deputy Chair Omisene Chattel with flashbang grenades going off, breaking windows, coming, um, coming in, you know, breaching the back of the, of the house as well, breaking windows in the basement, um, putting drones up into, up into the apartment and forcing and, and, and demanding that Chairman O'Malley should tell him to come down with his hands up as there were 20 or 30 armed military forces holding assault rifles with the red laser sightings at the chairman's chest, making it very clear that they had the power of life and death over him at that time, and that they could make of him what they had done and do to to the leaders of the African Revolution that we all we all know over over the years, and uh, and then after that, uh, deputy chair came down the, down the chair down the stairs and drone hit her in the head as she was going up, as we saw in the video. Uh, at the very same time, in in St. Petersburg, Florida, the Uhuru House, which has been there, the national headquarters of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, with all of the, it, its importance around the world, with the organization that the party has in Africa, in Europe, and throughout the United States. Uh, they raided that. You saw that, well, I don't know how many, was that 50? 50 uh, soldiers and uh, all different kinds of agents going in, reaching that place, just destroying every door, I think every single door on the outside and on the inside was just broken down, even if they could just open it and go in. They, they broke it down. They took files, they took archives that went back 50 years to the 1970s of, of photos and, and, and tapes and all different kinds of uh, burning sphere music, all, you know, just all kinds of things. Boxes and boxes and boxes of information and important history and the legacy of of the liberation struggle of, of the party and, and the African People's Socialist Party and the African Revolution. Just stole it, took it out. They took um, the chairman and all of our, our, um, our, our computers, our cell phones, anything else that, that we had as well. So they, their goal was to do damage. There were no indictments. The actual indictment, which is against a person in Russia, a Russian in Russia um, that they named the chairman on is absolutely obscene and ridiculous to say that a person from Russia could influence what the African Revolution is about and the question of genocide and reparations and, and all of this that, that that came from somebody in Russia is just absolutely absurd as we know and that uh, that you know, it was just another vicious counterinsurgency, counterintelligence 
assault on, on the struggle of African people for political power. And I do want to say that, that I am one of the co-conspirators, as was said, named, unindicted co-conspirators, along with Chairman Obama Shetela, also Comrade Jesse Neville, who is the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, who is here, is one of the uh, co-conspirators, as well as Akile Anai, who we saw in the video, who is the, the chair of the Department of Adjaprop and, and the editor of the Birmingham newspaper for the African People's Socialist Party, an incredibly brilliant leader. And I, I do want to say that I am incredibly honored, I am very honored to be what this government calls a co-conspirator with Chairman Omalia Shetela and the African Revolution. That is a badge of honor. <laughs> for that. 
and to say that, that, that the chairman created the African People's Solidarity Committee, and we saw that, as Lisa said, the Uhura Solidarity Center, which is on the south side of the white community, St. Louis, and has a banner that says, Unity Through Reparations, African People's Solidarity Committee, under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, and has tremendous support in the white community in the city where Mike Brown was murdered in 2014. And that the, the chairman, as the chairman has said, the, the solidarity movement was created as uh, to, to break the isolation so that they have to attack on two fronts when the police come, but it also breaks our self-imposed isolation from the rest of the world, enables us to have a principled relationship through the standard reparations to African people, to the African revolution, and to the future of this planet, which will be when African people are free, all oppressed people are free, and this vicious system is overturned once and for all. So I want to say unity through reparations. reparations. So hands off Uhura. Hands, hands off Uhura. 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 sure that everybody has uh, this information right here about what we can do. There will be a question and answer period, so please um, make sure that somebody want to pass this out in case people didn't get this. There's more over there. Here's some more literature, because like I said, we want to come out of here with uh, the thought of organizing and what we can do, what are the next steps, and how we can show our support. And I just want to say, Chairman, I'm a poet. I'm an undivided poet to the spirit of right on. I get this poet. I'm an undivided poet to the spirit of it. Because yeah, I want what you want, and I am that. Um, so, um, um, it gives me uh, such a great honor to introduce the chairman Amalia Shatella. Um, on that day when that happened, because let's just be real. I mean, North, the North community I'm so proud of, and most people in this room, I have a very good relationship with. And so there really is no <coughs> separation. There is no separation, no ideological separation between myself and Chairman O'Malley Yeshitala. I'm probably the Vice Chair of the Black and Black Coalition. He's the chair. So if they're rating him, what does that say about me? And what does that say about Everyone in this room, which is why I'm so glad you turned out, because it was a warning signal for all of us. One of the first things I did, I mean, it was very alarming, but I thought, oh my gosh, I got things I got to do. I better go in and take care of this before, you know, they come after me or anybody else. So that's what I did. I said, I got to make sure I take care of some of the business that was pending. Um, again, you heard uh, so much about the chairman. And um, I just want to say I stand by him. I stand by him based on his principles and the work that he has done in the African People's Socialist Party. I am very proud of the Black and Black Coalition. And I'm like, bring it, is what I say to the federal government. We are not afraid. Sister 
Vice Chairwoman uh, Lisa Davis. Uh, she is the Vice Chair of the Black and Black Coalition. <laughs> and um, I met Sister Lisa here, perhaps it was 2012, 2013, around that time, sometime right. around that time frame. And uh, I met her here uh, at a Black is Back uh, conference that we had, a national a annual conference. And she was in the audience. And she raised the question of having to do something around the issue of health care for African people. And she talked about how if an African went to prison and conscious and politically active prisoners, uh, uh, politically active uh, uh, individuals would uh, fill up the courtrooms and go to the prison to see about them, but uh, they would snatch us up in these hospitals and medical institutions on a regular basis, and, and we have to go through that alone. And she thought that was extremely problematic, and she wanted to see if we could do something to take this issue on, because I don't have to tell you about how African people and all colonized people are victimized uh, uh, by what they characterize as a healthcare uh, system. And of course, there is no healthcare system at all uh, here. And so she has played a leading role first in heading up, I asked her, why don't you head up a working group on this question? And she jumped right in and did it. And of course, she was doing it whether I asked her or not. And uh, beyond that, she became the vice chair. I want to express appreciation to the People's Organization of Progress for Progress. Uh, also, because uh, uh, it has been another entity that has opened its arms uh, to, to me, uh, to the Uhuru movement at different critical times, and even when we were working to build uh, the first mobilization uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., the Black and Black Coalition uh, held the first, the first, the very first uh, demonstration, national demonstration, uh, against the Obama regime at the White House. Uh, we did the first one when uh, many of the militants and so-called revolutionaries and communists and what have you uh, refused to touch it. Uh, and uh, the People's Organization of Progress, though it had a different position than we on this question, uh, recognize the significance of being able to mobilize against the kinds of things that the U.S. was doing uh, at that time under the Obama regime, and they came out in full support, and they opened their doors, their meetings uh, to me, uh, so that I was able to come through there, and I just wanted to express uh, appreciation for that and recognition of the kind of unity uh, that I know that is here. Newark, you have your own extraordinary history in terms of the struggle of our people, and I want to acknowledge that. So. Much has been said, you've seen some things. Uh, I feel it necessary to recount them myself uh, because the attack on our party and our movement on July 29th was of tremendous significance to our struggle. And we have to take it as something more significant than the, the uh, current news cycle. Uh, when it first happened, of course, there was an explosion of interest uh, by Africans and everybody. I mean, you, you, you'll be surprised, perhaps, uh, to see the numbers of, uh, of people and organizations from throughout the world and inside this country who uh, express, that express support, solidarity, opposition to what the FBI has done. And people did it for different reasons. Uh, most of them were genuinely opposed to what the FBI had done and uh, genuinely uh, expressed support and solidarity. That was genuine. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but people came from their own experiences in terms of how they approached that question and how that question was understood. And so as, as the news cycle uh, continues, the next thing that's uh, being talked about, if it's not uh, 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 Chris Rock getting slapped, or if it's not uh, 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 the woman in England, uh, the predator in England, uh, who just died, uh, or if it's not 
that uh, 39 people associated with Donald Trump have been subpoenaed. Uh, this news cycle is just going round and round, and it all been bunched up together. And so they, there's an tendency and ability to assume that what happened July 29th uh, to my home, uh, to our offices, et cetera, just is a part of the pattern. It's just a part of what's going on, part of what's happening. But it is of critical significance. It is of critical significance to black people, to Africans, and we have to organize and deal with it. Uh, because this, this extraordinary claim uh, that somehow, listen, uh, next month, next month, uh, I will be 81 years old. And, and, and for most of my life, for most of my life, I have been fighting against this system and what it does to Africans and oppressed people around the world. For most of my life. And I have done it before I ever met a Russian. You understand? I did it not because of Russia, but because of America. I did it not because of Russians, but because of what America does and has done historically to black people. That's the thing that has motivated me. I just think that we have to be clear on that. That's right. So everything they said is a lie. Yes. They stole my phone. They stole my iPad. They stole my wife's computer. They stole uh, tons and tons, thousands. Of, uh, of, of text messages, of communiques that we've had with each other around the world and with each other. They stole a Russian flag uh, that we had. I had bought four, uh, uh, especially during this, uh, this, this, this vicious war. It's a continuation of a war that's been going on for more than 100 years. I guess Russia started off as Soviet Russia. When all the colonial powers in the world, including the United States and Japan, invaded Russia in 1918 after the successful Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. All power to the people. That's right. See? And, and even when I talk about that, I, I really want us to understand some things about the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, what it's all about, what we are dealing with right now at this very moment. Because people appreciate Lenin, I appreciate Lenin. People appreciate the Bolshevik Revolution, I appreciate the Bolshevik Revolution. But the Bolshevik Re Revolution was ushered in, was, con was, was made possible and likely because of the first imperialist world war, they call it World War I. Do you know what that war was fought for? It was, to, it was a war to divide the world between predators. It happened just a few short years after the colonial powers of the world got together in Berlin, Germany, and, and prevented going to war by making a deal among themselves by carving up what? Africa. 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 And so, and so uh, this was the first attempt uh, to prevent the Europeans from going to war again because there have been war and war and war and they've been in the wars and they come up with a new a kind of deal, relationship between themselves. They even change the borders of the countries and things like that from time to time based on that. Uh, so the first imperialist world war, and so people remember that. It stands out. Lenin stands out. The Bolshevik stands out. Critical moment in history, but what was it? that made the Bolshevik Revolution possible and likely. First of all, Lenin and the Bolsheviks in Russia refused to participate uh, in, the, in, the, in the imperialist war uh, to the so-called defending the fatherland like all the other European communists did. Lenin said, not us. And even members of his own party wanted to deal with it, but Lenin said, not us. But what was it? that drove the revolutionary process to the surface in the first place. It was the colonial, the struggle against colonialism that was happening around the world. This is the thing that gave urgency to the first imperialist world war. You did. We did. That's what, when they were dividing up, they created the, the so-called League of, 
of nations for the purpose of, of having this assembly, this parliamentary process, where the white colonial powers could get together and have peaceful control of the world. We're not to kill each other. We're not to fight each other to dominate the world. That's what it was created for. This is the League of Nations. But what was happening? Revolutionary wars, struggles were happening all around the world. When they were sitting around the League of Nations, they were talking about who's going to get what part of Southwest Africa. Who was going to get this and that? And that's when Garvey stood up and said, Africa for Africans right. at home and abroad. That's, right. that's what Garvey stood up and said. That's, that's the context of Garvey's statement. He wasn't just coming up and saying, what kind of slogan can we come up with today? He was responding to concrete, material reality in the world where the colonial powers were talking about how they were going to continue to control and redefine Africa. But that's not the only thing that was happening. You're talking about the struggles that you saw how France and England were involved in. You see what's happening now in the so-called uh, uh, Middle East. Much of the borders that you see there were devised by France and England. They created what you now call Syria. They're the ones who created what we now identify as Lebanon. They're the ones who are responsible for the courage not having a homeland so that they are uh, 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 involved in struggle all over the place. They did that just like they sat down in Berlin and created the different ones of us, defined us the way they wanted to define us. So this is, this is the world they created, but they had to struggle. Struggle was happening. In Nicaragua, people wanted to be free. And so you had, at the same time, this war that was being made against San Nino. In Nicaragua, they were dropping bombs on us in Oklahoma. First military era bombardment that happened in, on, in this Western Hemisphere happened in, in Oklahoma against African people referred to as Black Wall Street. And, and the people who were struggling against colonialism in Nicaragua. It's the colonial dynamic that was driving everything. Because the whole white world rested on the platform of the colonial domination. You don't believe it? There are Marxists in here. And what Marx said was that what he referred to uh, 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 as, as, what did he call it? What kind of slavery did he characterize it? He, he called it uh, uh, this uh, this uh, wage. wage slavery, he called it. And even the name. He wasn't talking about Spartacus when he said wage slavery. <laughs> he wasn't talking about Spartacus. He said wage slavery required as a pedestal. Wage slavery in Europe required as a pedestal slavery pure and simple in what they call the New World. That's us. He was making the statement that capitalism Capitalism came into existence and required uh, the colonial domination of the peoples of the world. Our struggle, July 29th, in the most economically depressed sector of St. Louis, and this attack by the FBI, and the attack in St. Petersburg, Florida. This started 600 years ago when Portugal uh, began, initiated the slave, the selling black people. That's where it started. This is the process that hooked the whole world up into a single world economy. It was a colonial economy. It's been characterized as a capitalist mode of production. It's a colonial mode of production. Mm -hmm. All of the production rested on the base of African and other peoples being colonized. You look around the world, you look at the so-called Americans, everything you see and what they characterize as the Americans came about as they exist as a consequence of the so-called slave trade. Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, Puerto Rico, all of them. The attack on African and African people. You need to understand this, because otherwise, they'll be able to convince you that serving subpoenas on 30 some odd members of the Trump administration of Trump supporters is equal to this attack that they made on Africa on July 29th in St. Louis and in St. Petersburg, Florida. It ain't the same. 
No, it's not. It ain't the same. And what we're looking at, when you're looking at Trump, you're looking at activity that's occurring on this pedestal that Marx talked about. That is required for the existence of a whole capitalist system. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's true. That's why you see, you used to be able to see, like, uh, workers uh, in oil fields in Nigeria making the price of, of gasoline go up in lieu. Workers who struggling for their rights to take their resources in Nigeria, the price of oil goes up. The price of gasoline goes up in various other places around the world because it's a colonial mode of production. And if you can't see that, you can't see yourself. And you can't see your own significance. And it's critical that we see ourselves and see our own significance. I just want to say that. I think it's really important for us to understand that. We can talk more about that at some other time. And I think we must talk about it. Because revolution is a science and an art. That's right. And the thing is, what we have to become more aware of and conscious of, and we were extraordinarily conscious of this in the 1960s, even though there were so many questions that went unresolved. The fact is that we were not talking about Black Lives Matter. We were not talking about hands up, don't shoot. In the 1960s, the fact is that people were organizing, black people were organizing, oppressed people, or Puerto Ricans were organizing, indigenous people here and around the world were organized to take power over our own lives. If you ain't talking about power, what the hell are you doing in the room? Mm. Right. And then if you are talking about power, then you need the instruments through which you will attain that power. Otherwise, as Brother Carr said, he reminded me of my uncle, uh, who was a pretty bad guy, he said, conversation is the cheapest commodity on the block. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got one, yeah. right? So it's not what you say, it's what you do, right. Right? Right. right? And if you believe that we have to be free, then freedom has to be translated in having power over our own lives. Right. And if we're talking about power over our own lives, what power are we talking about except state power? How do we run a state power? Come on, state geez. power is that force that monopolizes violence in the, in the in the in the in the interest of whatever is the social system that exists at the moment. State power is the FBI coming to my house at five o'clock in the morning, threatening me and my wife and destroying our properties. State power, the state legalizes itself. The state legalizes itself. I know they say, well, the Constitution says this and this and this. The state legalizes itself. I mean, I remember, I think about this. Uh, the fact is that Nat Turner, the extraordinary Nat Turner, uh, who struck, I said, struck at night and spare no one. That was his slogan. It wasn't, hands up, don't shoot. It wasn't, black lives don't matter. Strike at night and spare no one. Sort of sounds like a brother over there in Haiti who said, Kupete, Bulika. He said, he says, he said, cut heads and burn houses. Because you have to have your own power. It's the responsibility, the duty of the slave to kill the slave master mm -hmm. and destroy the system of slavery. Mm -hmm. right. How can you live? How can there be anything like dignity among a people that voluntarily accepts this? But Africans don't voluntarily accept it. And that's why you have this colonial state power. That's why I know some of you believe in this stuff, but it ain't true about the so-called Willie Lynch syndrome. Ain't no white man moves up and then say, this is how you control black people for 100 years, et cetera, et cetera. If the white man wrote that and that worked, 
then they wouldn't have to have a police on every corner in your community. Come on, brother. That's right. That's, right. that's, right. that's, right. that's, right. that's the black yeah, petty bourgeoisie. Don't expect to fight nobody about nothing that's talking about Willie Lynch did that and blaming us on the thing instead of the state. And the colonial state is vicious. Has no regard for those of us who are colonized anywhere on the planet Earth. Nowhere on Earth. And when they deal with us, things like uh, things like conventions, uh, as it relates to the United Nations and other things, that they don't, they don't, it doesn't matter. It's war without terms that they make against us. My wife and I were sitting up at when they came to our house at five o'clock in the morning. We were sitting around the table uh, talking about how we were going to be dealing with the day. I'm getting ready to go to the gym. That was Friday. And so that's back at biceps for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and what she was doing, uh, we were talking because that's the same day that we uh, were implementing a program that she uh, is over. She's over most of the economic work that we're involved in, and this kind of political work too. Because we say that politics ain't nothing but what? Concentrated economics. Mm. Politics ain't nothing but concentrated economics. Okay. And our problem, of course, is that we ain't got no economics, so we use somebody else's economics used to control our politics. <laughs> Except the politics of revolution. The politic of anti-colonialism, right? And then you have economic programs, Brother Cobb, right? You have economic programs to negate the power of the colonizer. Right. That's your political program. And so as you're seeing that their politics and economics are what? So anyway, we're sitting around at the table, and we are initiating this program that on this day, we had planned for 20, and but there would be something like 16 African women who would go through this program. We've initiated training doulas, midwives, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Because in St. Louis, you have a situation where enough black babies die in the first year of life to fill 15 kindergarten classes every year. Mm. The Russians didn't tell me that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying? The Russians didn't tell me that. That's right. That's They're right. killing my babies, you understand? And if I complain about it, they say, it ain't you talking, it's the Russians saying that, right? This is how they're trying to divert uh, criticism from what the system does to African people. And so, uh, that's how we happen to be up. Because we're talking about this program. By the way, the program did happen. The sisters did come to the Aurora House. The sisters did get the training to be doulas. And the sisters are now involved in training that we're providing so they can set up their own business as doulas, taking care of business. You understand? So that's what we do. That's what we were doing, and that's how we happened to be up when they came. And so here, here we are sitting around uh, talking. And this, this racket from outside comes, everybody in, in this resident, come out with your hands up and your hands empty. Mm -hmm. pre -dawn. And so, first we're not sure if, 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 if we're really hearing this correctly. Uh, because in St. Louis, you know, occasionally you have tornadoes coming through and there's tornado warning and what have you, so this racket comes out. And so, are they talking about us? <laughs> and so, uh, I asked her to stay, let me go first. And, and you stay and call the comrades, let them know we're being raped. They say, this is the FBI. And when I went downstairs, I'm greeted, first of all, by an armored vehicle parked in front of my house. Parking is bad enough without that. <laughs> and so here's an armored vehicle parked in front of the house. And when I open the door, as the comrade mentioned, uh, uh, I'm hit in the chest, not by, not by one or two or three, but a whole bunch of red dots coming from uh, targeting lasers on automatic weapons being held by this military force in camouflage outfits and flak jackets, right? 
Uh, that's what hits me right in the chest. I open the door, and and when I open the door, uh, I didn't see it, but my wife uh, was uh, affected because this drone comes right behind, right uh, behind me, and goes up the stairwell uh, and almost hits her in the head. At the same time, flashbang grenades. Grenades are going off all around the house. And uh, I was to learn that even they had penetrated the stairwell, the back stairwell of the house. And grenades are going off in the back stairwell of the house. This is, this is what the FBI did. This is a military force. I'm not talking about some suit and tie wearing, wingtip, uh, shoe, uh, shod uh, uh, white guys. I'm talking about forces in military flat jackets, camouflage outfits with automatic weapons that are telling me in no uncertain terms that I'll kill you. That you would die. Now, if I want you to die, you will die. That's what those, those target lasers uh, were saying to me. When I walked out, of course, I'm thinking Fred Hampton. Because it was 4 o'clock in the morning when the FBI set him up in Chicago and murdered him and, and, and Mark Clark. And so that's what's on my mind when I walk out, out the door. And so I really thought that, uh, that uh, they were going to kill me at that moment. And instead, you know, they asked me, they required me to come out. They zip-tied me behind my back. They put handcuffs on my wife behind her back. And I'm asking, what is this about? She said, well, we got a, a warrant, a search warrant for your house. I said, well, let me see it. They say, well, I don't have it with me right now, but some, you know, but it's, it is over there somewhere with somebody. So uh, uh, then they take my cell phone, and as I mentioned, they took all of these other devices that we had. They stole them all, stole all of these devices. And they wanted me to sit on the curb, where then you can sit in the back seat of the car when you want to sit on the curb. I want to sit in place. I want to. I want to. I want to do Western snipes and bounce. And uh, so, uh, finally, they said, uh, "I'm. Are we under arrest?" No, you're not under arrest. So they said, "They said finally you can leave." Before that, they said that there's an indictment that's coming down later today of a Russian national who's in Russia, and your name is involved in the indictment. Let me see the indictment. They say uh, that's going to be happening later this morning. I can't show it to you now. But it's going to be in the news. It's going to be a lot of, this is going to make the news, is what they say. And so it is, you know, like a propaganda ploy, among other things that they are doing. And uh, so uh, they occupied the Uhura Solidarity Center on the south side of St. Louis, which is the majority white uh, community. Uh, they used battering rams, knocking in doors and what have you. They used the uh, flashbang grenades there as well. They held people at gunpoint there, handcuffed, uh, and they occupied the Solidarity Center for something like six hours. They were in my house. Yeah, uh, they said, if I wanted to, listen, brother, I see you gone, but we need that support. Concrete support? Okay. Gotta have it. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, uh, so they, they took all of those devices and what have you. So they have everything. I mean, they know uh, when I had an argument with my wife, if we texted about it or we said anything like that about it, uh, uh, we didn't. <laughs> but uh, 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 they, they have all kinds of stuff. They will, they will use this to tell a story they want to tell. But this is what I want to tell you. We're a transparent organization. They have, put, they have put snitches, informants, provocateurs in our organization. And some of these provocateurs have been relatively effective. They've even won some other Africans to take the most reactionary stances against our party. Let me tell you who we are. All you've got to do is open the Brain Spear newspaper. You'll see what our program is. It's been there since 1979. Our program around reparations is in there since 1979. Our program de declaring the treatment of the peoples, uh, Africans and others, as genocide is 1979. 
59. It's been there. This notion that somehow the Russians had us to go around and participate in getting petitions because the United States is committing genocide against black people is nonsensical. Yeah. It is easily disproved by the fact that you can go to the Brainsville newspaper and look at the program. From 1979, you will see that position. They said that, uh, that we uh, ran a campaign in 2016, uh, was it 2017 and 2019, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, and St. Uh, 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 Louis, Missouri, because the Russians wanted to do this, wanted us to do this, because they can bring uh, discredit to the electoral process in this country. I mean, you got thousands of white people on January 6th scaling the walls of the Capitol like spider people, <laughs> chasing the vice president through the hollow halls, talking about hanging him and defecating in the joint. Not a single flash bang grenade gone off yet. Yeah. But we are the ones who are bringing disrepute to the electoral process in this country. They have, they have something like 400, more than 400 pieces of legislation and state legislators throughout this country right now designed to undermine the ability of black people to participate in elections. They did that, not me. And 18 states in this country have already passed laws limiting the ability of black people to vote. And we are the ones who are somehow undermining the pristine uh, electoral process in this country. They don't believe that. And then, of course, our position on Ukraine. Because uh, we say uh, that what has happened in Russia is a continuation of war in Ukraine, a continuation of the same war. And as recently, of course, uh, when was it? Is uh, 19, was it 97? And when was the, the collapse of, of, uh, of the Soviet Union? 91. Uh, and you saw Clinton, you know, running around. Uh, Celebrating before, I don't know if they had found that Monica Lewinsky's dress was missing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, uh, and then and then they began them moving sharply and hard, you know, like uh, taking up all the space. They're rushing. But before that, James Earl Carter, as Dick New Brzezinski, his national security advisor, had gone into Africa. Afghanistan, they have, they're the ones who created the modern jihad. They trained them, armed them, sent them into Afghanistan because they were friends with the Soviet Union and because Afghanistan was close to the border of the Soviet Union. You knew that. They know that. They hope that you don't know it or they hope that you don't care. They hope that we will not be organ well enough organized to do this thing, to respond to it. So they don't like our position on Ukraine. And you're supposed to like the position on Ukraine. Because, uh, I mean, you can't pick up anything. Well, now you can, but the dead white woman uh, uh, in England. You know, you can't turn on anything. You know, I'm stuck in one of these hotel rooms, and every time I turn on the hotel television, they still bury that woman. <laughs> 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 what, do you, what do you call it, dead but not yet dead? <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, so, and then this creep, Zelensky, this, this remarkable, heroic Zelensky, they have given how many billions of dollars? I know the last time that was 60, good. Something like 60 billion dollars or so. That's my money. I ain't talking about just as no taxpayer. I'm talking about the reparations that you owe us. What the hell are you doing spending your head? You know, uh, so these, you know, this is just, just ridiculous. And I'm not even, I'm not, I don't expect America or uh, or this guy, uh, Joe Biden, Hunter's daddy. <laughs> I'm not expecting them to take some kind of revolutionary stance. 
But I am expecting all these white people who say they believe in American democracy. Enshrined in these noble documents of freedom of speech. That's all I'm exercising. Free speech, you say. Hold, hold you to that. I'm not asking you to be a revolutionary. Uh, you say that uh, you believe uh, in uh, what they like to refer to uh, as, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, uh, some kind of imperial democracy, or, uh, demo uh, or capitalist democracy. Uh, but the basic uh, thing about it is that there's supposed to be this equality uh, that people enjoy uh, through being able to uh, exercise uh, the struggle for power through the electoral process. You heard that before. Bill of Rights. Uh, they, they said we're supposed to be able to do that through the electoral process. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, and this is really important for this is issue, that we have never had access to the electoral process. Never had access to the electoral process. The elections in, in this country are nothing but non-violent contests between different sectors of the ruling class for control of the state. I'm not saying don't do something with them. I'm saying that's what it was constructed of. And it was they were created before, before they even assumed or suggested that black people could vote. And about the time of 1965, that's when the Voting Rights Act was passed in this country. By this time, of course, they killed Malcolm in 65, wasn't it? And then in 68, they killed King. And then in uh, 69, they killed Fred. And then throughout the 60s, they're just killing all revolutionaries and destroying revolutionary organizations all together. So then they say, you can vote. But now you ain't got nothing to vote for. You ain't got no program to vote for. The Democratic Party is not a revolutionary organization. It will not have your program on the ballot. So we put reparations on the ballot say, okay, we're going to vote. We initiate schools where we're teaching ordinary people how to participate in the electoral process, but we're teaching them what it is that you should be looking at when you participate. Put reparations on the ballot. There's some places in this country where you can actually Put reparations on the ballot. Put it on the ballot. Make them have to vote for it. Even if they say, no, 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 that informs black people what this country thinks. And that, because every, every people, every instance, people always look for the easy way to solve a problem. You never heard anybody say, let's find a hard way to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So the easy way seems to be vote. Okay, vote. Vote for reparations. Put black reparations on the ballot. Put black community control of the police on the ballot. Uh, put you know, these kinds of issues in questions. And so with the Black is Black Coalition, we pulled together a 19-point national democratic program for self-determination, national black agenda for self-determination. We took it through 11 states in this country uh, with conventions, and black people voted on that. And so we said, now on. Any African who's running for office, anybody who's running for office, even Joe Biden or uh, uh, or Bernie up. Running for office, you gotta adopt. You gotta adopt this 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 program for the support of black people. That ain't, they don't want that. They don't want black people to participate in the elections. And I can tell you what they did. They had 21 carloads of, uh, of pigs who attacked the debate for mayor in St. Petersburg, Florida. 2000. What was that? 17. 2017. That's when. When uh, Lisa, the same meeting that Lisa was talking about, the white man who was running for mayor also said that you got your reparation when you got the bomb, mm -hmm. and then catch the next flight uh, back to Africa. Mm -hmm. That was it. They had twenty. They didn't send the police to get him. They sent twenty-seven carloads of police for a debate <laughs> that the party was involved in. I want to say that. Now, the only thing I want to say is that we have the work to do. There are three things that's clear in terms of what's been identified by the United States government is problematic. One, Russia. They see a real contention with Russia now. The whole social system is in tremendous despair, uh, disrepair. The whole thing is fracturing. American society is fracturing. You got, there's not 
it's not clear whether there is going to be an election in 2024, and if there is going to be a election in 2024, it's not clear what is going to be the outcome. I don't mean in terms of who gets elected, I mean in terms of who will be allowed to be elected, and if they get elected, will they be allowed to be seated? You think that's for our best? No. I'm telling you, I'm looking at the, the at journals of the bourgeoisie, that ain't written for us. You won't find this in your checkout lines when you are uh, going to get your groceries and stuff. But read foreign affairs. Read the things they're concerned about. Read about the, the annual uh, Munich Security Council meetings. They have every year in Munich, Germany, where, where you have uh, ambassadors and you have people who heads of state, Zuckerberg, attend these meetings. Read how in 2020, one of the big issues that they were dealing with, are these are big shots. Is the, is, the, is approaching restlessness. Did you hear what I just said? I ain't talking about some quite kid from Buffalo who goes from who goes into Buffalo and kill all these people. They say he's inspired by some kind of of, of a replacement theory. I'm talking about the big shots here. These are the thinking representatives of white power who are having these discussions about approaching restlessness. The disappearance of the so-called West. And by West, it's not simply geographic, because they're talking about white people in New, New Zealand as well. And Australia, you know, they're talking about the colonizers. And they are, all of them are afraid of being replaced. And they will be replaced, because the oppressed peoples of the world, the colonized, will take power over our own lives. And the whole social system rests on the foundation of our oppression. I'm asking you to join with us. Uh, go to handsoffuhuru.org. Uh, uh, participate in building this massive campaign that we have to build. Because we're not treating this as a defense committee, because we are talking about a counter-offensive committee. They attacked us. We, I was there in the 60s. I did voter registration and education work. I worked for this guy. Who was it who they sent looking for Monica Lewinsky's dress? Who got this dress? Her, what's his name? George. What's his name? Vernon John. I did voter registration work in a program uh, that he had mm. in the 1960s. I faced, you know, uh, frothing at the mouth crackers who would kill you for just trying to get uh, African people registered to vote. I was an outside agitator. I've seen the situation where they were bombing our churches, saying that we were sent by Russians, saying that we were sent by outsiders, and what have you. What in the hell? is the difference in, a, in, a, in a, a, a white person, a colonizer, bombing a church in Birmingham in 1963 because outsiders are responsible for it because people want to vote, and the FBI bombing my house at 5 o'clock in the morning of July 29th because they said the Russians told us to be involved in the electoral process. I want to sue the FBI for violation of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. <laughs> money because it ain't over and because uh, the situation in this country is very serious and the country, the leaders of this country have astutely, if you will, determined that Russia is a problem because it's intruding on spaces that they've occupied uh, by themselves for the longest period of time. They decided that China is a problem. They see China is the big problem, uh, by the way, uh, because China is intruded on this economic and political spaces that they've monopolized for a long period of time. And as quiet as it's kept, they decided Africa is a point of contention as well. It is credible. There's not a single modern economy in the world that could exist without the resources that they've taken from our Africa. That not one, not China, not Russia, not America, not England, uh, none of them could exist without those resources. And for the first time, since the Garvey movement, we are building a revolutionary African movement, not, not a Nigerian movement, not a Ghana movement, not a so-called black American movement, but an African movement. The African People's Socialist Party exists in the United States, and they know it. That's how they know my address. Uh, exists uh, in the Caribbean, they know it. Uh, we, they got all of our information, all the texts, all of the communications that we've had with each other. We exist all over the continent of Africa. We exist uh, in England, black people, 
Uh, we exist in France, African people. And if you're in France, anybody who's familiar with that knows, if you're in France, you're in various other Francophone states uh, on the continent of Africa as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we, have, we have presence in places like Belgium and Sweden. Uh, we are there rebuilding a revolutionary movement because we completed, concluded a long time ago that the African Revolution has outlived its capacity when fought within the confines of the colonial created borders. That's there. No borders control what France does in Africa. No borders control what America does in Africa. No borders control the exploitation of our people by the European powers of America and the rest of them. And no borders should be able to control our struggle for liberation. So they see these as problems. I know I'm not just one of these frothing at the mouth black nationalists who love Africa so much I just tell you anything. I'm telling you to look at the fact that for the first time in its 246 year history, uh, the United States Marines has given a four star to a black man. His name is Michael Lang Blangley. You know what his job is? Africa. Africa. He is over controlling Africa. You know what the outgoing head of Africa said? That the biggest strategic problem they got on the continent of Africa is, is extremism. Among, on Africa, that's us. We are black, remember, you know what black is extremism, is, right? Extremism in Africa and China and Russia that they have to contend with. This is what we're looking at. This is things that's, that's challenging the existing political and economic configuration of the globe right now. And they're concentrated on that. The struggle we're involved in is bigger than Redbud uh, uh, Avenue in St. Louis. And we have to really step up and recognize what our responsibility is uh, to pursue our freedom, our liberation, and to be absolutely completely dissatisfied with the whole notion that anybody should ever govern us again except ourselves. Y'all heard me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Got to be absolutely decided. I'm just saying it ain't enough. You got to do something, right? Amen. So, anyway, I've over talked it. And I want to recognize uh, uh, Black Agenda Report uh, for being on the scene. Comment Margaret Kimberly. Uh, Glenn Ford was my dear comrade. In fact, uh, he worked with me in terms of uh, creating the National Black Political Agenda for Self-Determination I just told you about. You know. And uh, so I want to just thank you so much. You've been so kind to me. You didn't throw a single object at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I uh, exceeded the time frame that you had allotted me to speak. I'm hoping that your presence here also means that you are prepared to take a stance around this case. I really hope that you're willing to do that. And there are all kinds of ways that you can do that. Uh, lawyers are really important. Mm -hmm. What happens to us, brothers and sisters, too often is that, uh, that the so-called white liberals and white leftists who have all the resources in the world. They have resources, they have lawyers, they have money. Uh, one of the most notorious leftists, uh, uh, white leftists from this country, his daddy was a judge in Oakland. He used to follow the Black Panther Party around all the time. You know? Uh, now I used to hear about he was the greatest revolutionary since Malcolm X, this white guy who lived in France. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, 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 but the thing is this, we are going to use all the democratic space that we fought for. This whole issue of elections, it was Africans who died fighting to, to, to be able to participate in elections. I don't remember a single white person except somebody who was riding with some black people who were doing voter registration uh, uh, who was killed. Black people, our churches were bombed and what have you. We fought for that space. We fought for that space, and we have to maintain that space. But the fact is that what they would do in every instance is shut down all the democratic space. So you don't have any of the democratic space. You can't run for office. You can't talk about this. You can't do this and do that. And when they shut down the democratic space, 
they can push you into being underground prematurely. Huey P. Newton was right that a revolutionary never voluntarily go, goes underground. Right, that's right. You are the democratic space. We fought for that democratic space. That's why to deny us lawyers, to deny us the kind of resources, is collaboration. It's collaboration with, our, with the colonizers because they will push us into premature actions. And we need to exhaust every bit of the democratic space that's available. That's the process of winning African people to a greater consciousness and a greater state of organization so that we can take back power over our own lives. Uhuru. Uhuru. chairman was talking about earlier to, well, he said, uh, I was going to say defend, but he said counter attack. So I like that better than defend the global African revolution in this hands off Uhuru um, case. So the first thing I'd like to ask you guys to do, uh, I, I want to just say one word. Um, back in the 60s, they used to say revolutionary time. This is revolution time. And um, this is that, that time again. And I'm asking you, you could start by taking your phones out and go to handsoffuhuru.org and click on the donate sign. Any amount, no matter how small, no matter how large, we're going to take it. Because we've got to have this counteroffensive from the, what the FBI did to us and by extension did to African people globally. So I ask you to do that. Um, and I just want to say another, another thing. Um, I want to say a greeting that we say in Khmeric language, Ankuja Seneb. 
which means life, health, and prosperity. Now, we know African people, that ain't happening without this revolution. That collective life, health, and prosperity is what we're fighting for to, de to destroy global colonialism, neo-colonialism, and parasitic capitalism. And this starts by going to handsoffuhuru.org, clicking on that donate. Comrade Lisa also has here, if you, if you don't want to do that, you can give cash money. We take cash money too. You can fill out the pledge form, put your cash money in the envelope, and we appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, comrades? Ooh. 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 Well, people want to um, just, okay. want to type, I want to give you the Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Um, I'll start it out $50. I match Sister Lisa. I will match you. I will donate $50. Anybody want to try $25,000? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Come on, comrades. You got a point, Oh, 
I shouldn't do this. Um, we got money from. Speaking of Ken Bay, the chaos, he gave 20, he got 20 from him. Right on. The two, Matt, he gave 50. Right on. Um, he got 50 from Fred Nugent. Brother Todd, having uh, $60. Um, I know I'm missing people. Right. 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 So we, got, we got 350 <laughs> from P.O.P.
I don't know what's going on in the Senate with it because I don't think they passed it. But basically, they will. it calls for the United States to monitor the activities of every African, every black person on the globe and every country in Africa as it came to Russian activities. Because they don't want nothing to interfere with the interests of the United States. And they also praised Ukraine in that bill. Ukraine, which is um, the bastion for neo-Nazism. John Conyers had condemned Ukraine. And he had uh, passed um, some kind of measure saying, don't, don't contribute to Ukraine any longer because they are, you know, this... Um, this new, you know, they have all these neo-Nazi activities going on, and I'll just say this, because we know, um, because um, of a Russian person that the chairman knows, and he hasn't run from that. That was no secret, but this was a guy talking about anti-globalism in Russia. But the Ukraine, and there's been so much, there's been so much information if you just go into you, look at Ukraine and neo-Nazism, and you're going to see they've been talking about that forever. And in fact, when somebody, I think it was in New Zealand, had killed about 50 people in a church uh, several years ago or in a mosque, he had connections with Ukraine with the Azov Battalion. The person who went into Buffalo, New York, and gunned down 10 black people, he had connections. And the insignia from the Azov Battalion in Ukraine, when so much of when we hear about all of these shootings, there has been so much activity online. Many of them have a very, very large and disturbing um, uh, uh, social media footprint talking about, about, talking about guns, talking about this, talking about even their association with um, Ukraine, but nothing was done about that. They come after the black liberation struggle because one Russian person talked about anti-globalism, but yet these neo-Nazis, they can talk about that all the time, and they do, and they know it. They couldn't get a drone in that school, in Uvalde, that, what, that school, Uvalde, Texas, or wherever, well, they couldn't get a drone in there where they were killing those children. But they can send a drone into the house of Chairman O'Malley and Shatala. All the FBI, they're calling on themselves because they could do a whole lot more than what they have been doing with these mass shooters who have a massive online footprint. Talking in these talk rooms and everything. And, um, Many of them have shown great sympathy or great empathy with um, Ukraine, the neo-Nazi movement in Ukraine. But here's what the FBI, the FBI comes after us, as we know. But anyway, and, and the Congressional Black Caucus and Congress, the Democrats basically said, do, go on and do what you got to do. Basically endorse what they did to the chairman gave them the license to do that they were going to do anyway. But yeah, that's what they did. And they said to monitor all the black people all across the world, including in the United States, of those just targeting black people. That's your Democratic Party. That's your Congressional Black Caucus. That's the spot. And without further ado, we will hear from our brilliant and valiant sister, Sister Margaret Kimberman. I just want to say this, that when the word went out about what happened, um, what the FBI did. The journalists were on it immediately. Margaret Kimberly was one of them. And we are so appreciative for all who have used their platform to continue to put this out there. Um, they have just been very supportive. And we are appreciative of your work. We are appreciative of what you do. She, works with the Black Agenda Report. She's an author, Pre Presidential is your book. And it's just, we're so great to have you here on this side of the room. I just want to big up Newark. Uh, we had a goal of raising $1,000. We've raised $1,095. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will be quick. I'm
I'm going to take less time than Lisa gave me time, Mark. All right. Uh, how are the people? How are the people? People. How are the people? It's great to be here. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I want to add another group that have a couple people here, Black Alliance for Peace. There's a few folks here from Black Alliance for Peace. And, uh, as a part of Black Agenda Report, where uh, our late comrade, who uh, O'Malley, uh, Chairman O'Malley referred to as a very active member of Black Is Back Coalition, and is responsible for his mentorship for me being where I am now. Um, and I, uh, yes, I am. We were at Black Agenda Report immediately on this story. I interviewed the chair, he's the only person I had, we talked for like 50 minutes, he was the only person I had when I felt like I needed to, to do it. But anyway, but this is how I introduced our segment. I said, the raids were conducted as part of the indictment of a Russian national accused of acting as a foreign agent in the U.S., but the FBI's actions are part of an old U.S. playbook targeting black radical organizations which assert their rights to speak in opposition to U.S. policies domestically and internationally. Omalia Yeshitela and the Uhuru movement remain steadfast in defending their right to free association and free assembly that Americans are supposed to have. But those rights are rarely granted to us, the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. When it comes to us, these don't seem to count. And I suppose it's true in 1857 in the Dred Scott's case. What did they say? Right. Black people had no right to which a, a white man was bound to respect. And I guess they were talking, looking ahead to the 21st century as well. And um, it is a fight because we're viewed as dangerous just by virtue of existing. And that's why we're always targeted. Now, this case is supposed to be about Russia, but we shouldn't add to any confusion by thinking that's the only issue. The system is always looking for ways to crush our movements. The Russiagate ho hoax, and yes, I'm using Donald Trump's terminology because it actually happens to be true, was very useful. It prevented him from changing U.S. foreign policy, even if he really wanted to, and uh, gave the Democratic Party a weapon to use um, indefinitely. Uh, we're free to choose our politics, but when we do, we're seen as dangerous. It was, re it was recently revealed that Aretha Fla Franklin, yeah. Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul, was under S FBI surveillance for many years, and her crime was being a conscious black person, yeah. a movement person, who defended Angela Davis publicly, among other things. But I'm going to read briefly from our uh, BAP, Black Alliance for Peace statement, BAP believes that these raids continue the history of state repression directed against black people in the U.S. This repression now occurs under the guise of opposing adversary nations, but regardless of how these actions are characterized, black people still bear the brunt of surveillance and police violence. The, AF, the APSP has the right to freely associate with people around the world, to hold any political beliefs it may choose, and to express them without fear of intimidation, persecution, or prosecution. And I want to add, uh, Lisa preempted some of what I was going to say. Uh, this countering malign Russian influence in Africa, Act HR 7311, uh, this is... Um, and the current chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. You can boo. Go ahead, boo. Uh, and uh, giving the U.S. the this authority to monitor, Afri monitor African nations. But that's going to be us as well. Yes. It, it, is, uh, it uh, presumes that the U.S. has the right to decide who African nations can talk to. But that will also mean us. And that is why it's so important for us to be in solidarity with uh, Chairman Omalia Chitella, with all those who are under this attack, and with the Uhuru movement. And in doing so, we are defending ourselves as well. Uhuru. Thank you. Thank you so much.
will have Vice Chair of the People's Organization Project, Larry Adams. Fortunately, he spoke, he, he, he was under COVID then, yeah. he gave, uh, sent uh, uh, to the D12 uh, press conference, statement of solidarity. And that's the fundamental reason I'm here. But before I get to that, we're here celebrating the leadership of one of our outstanding freedom fighters. But yesterday, right. yeah. we also lost yeah. the body of one of our outstanding freedom fighters, and that's Brother Saladin Muhammad yeah. from the Black Workers for Justice, who was in the territory of the Black Belt Nation in, the state, in North Carolina, working as he has worked his whole life. So I would ask that this gathering could stake a moment of silence and remember the fighting spirit of Brother Saladin Muhammad. Long live the fighting spirit of Saladin Muhammad. Long live. But the fundamental reason I'm here is to declare pop solidarity with the African People's Socialist Party, Democratic Uhuru Movement, Chairman Omar Yeshatel, and Vice Chair Sister Oni Zeni. And to condemn the fascist attack by U.S. imperialism on the chairman and the organizations by their FBI, their political police. Mm -hmm. You know they don't ever bust no white collar criminals. Mm -hmm. yeah. They didn't bust the no mafia when they were rounding up Black Panthers, when they were crushing the Brown Berets, when they were crushing the Red Berets. They're the political police to maintain white supremacist domination in this society. To keep the pill to keep support of US imperialism. And this is over. And we must all recognize that an attack on one is an attack on all of us. Yes, and if they don't come for you today, they'll come for you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so and our task is to be steadfast in supporting the fighters and to condemn the enemy. And understand that the bourgeois state is the enemy Indeed. and coming after all those who fight for freedom. Mm -hmm. All those. And recognize and recognize that the Black Liberation Movement has stood as a vanguard in the fight for democracy and fundamental transformation of the U.S. society. And so the vanguard organizations of Black Black Liberation Movement become the targets. Yes. And so we got to keep our spear points sharp and defend them at all costs. The pretext of the Russian involvement is so false and without credibility, we don't need to spend any more time talking about it. Because it has been on material conditions, as the chairman pointed out, that produces the reaction. Where reaction is a reaction. And it's the oppression for 500 years that has resulted in 500 years of resistance. And that it absolutely is a continuum of the resistance of our people for capture on the continent through the Middle Passage, through the enslavement in this country, through all of the stages that I don't have to go through because I'm preaching to the converted. But understand that the attack on the African People's Socialist Party is an attack on all black people who resist, and all allies, and all other social forces in this country who resist. When I said the BLM has been the vanguard of the movement for democracy and transformation, Understand, I mean, yeah, we're, most of us in here, well, some of y'all kind of young, but most of us in here <laughs> are young, old enough to recognize that the other progressive social movements in this country rose in the wake yeah. of the civil rights movement, of which we have a veteran. Those SNCC fighters 
who went to the South to fight for democratic space and were lynched and burned and harassed, except driven crazy, locked up, co-opted. That movement spearheaded by black masses and led by black leaders gave rise to other groups. It is the react this is the reaction. The attack on, on, on September on July 29th is the reaction to the rise of, to, to opposition to the George Floyd movement. Mm -hmm. It's the largest mobilization of masses of all nationalities and cultures and nations in this country. They said, oh, they're rising up. They're rising up. So they not only have contradictions overseas with their competitors, and who's going to control the resources of Africa, who's going to control the resources of that part of Europe that the Ukraine is in, but they've got to try to keep their backyard pacified. That means put down those liberation movements, and that means that the spearhead of that is the Black Liberation Movement. While it's painful, we should understand that the attacks reflect the weakness of the imperialist system. Indeed. That it is weakening, as Chairman Mao told us years ago, it's the wounded tiger. That it can be most dangerous. But understand that the wound is there. The system is in decline. It's not getting strong. So that's what calls us to ensure that we defend the fighters that we organize ourselves to prepare for the opportunities, to take advantage of the opportunities of where the system shows itself as weak. We recognize that we've learned from our history and that the attack in St. Petersburg, the attack in St. Louis is a continuation of COINTELPRO. That's right. We know they may have changed the file name or moved the office, but that the bourgeois state has never ceased to repress. That's what it is. It's organized violence to preserve the position of the ruling class. That's what the state is. And what's important about what's the essence of the state? Monopoly on violence. The monopoly on violence. So it is the military that is the heart of the state. The FBI is the political police is the heart of the state. And that's what they turn loose on us. So be mindful. Freedom ain't free, and it won't happen easy. Yeah. And understand that it will come to a physical fight mm -hmm. at some point. But as the chairman says, we don't want to be baited into any premature actions. So we will maximize the democratic space that has been won through blood. The, democrat, the democratic rights to seek self-determination, what this organization is for, mm -hmm. what POP stands for. So we are allies in the struggle for black self-determination. That's a democratic right of all oppressed nations and peoples. Self-determination, to declare who we are, what we're about, how we want to organize production and economy. The attack. In St. Petersburg and St. Louis is a shot across the bow to the black liberation movement and to all those who resist oppression. It's a shot across the bow intended to intimidate us. You want to know terrorism? That was state terrorism. That was state terrorism, not only aimed at the primary targets, but everybody around. Flashbangs, that's to terrorize the whole community. That's to isolate. Yeah. COINTEL pros function? Yeah. Isolate the revolutionaries yeah. from the masses of people. Must be something wrong with them. The good guys are attacking them. That's what TV tells us, right? Those are the good guys, 15 different FBI programs on, 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 the, on the air these, these days. They will not quell our resistance. No. They will only inspire us to get better at what we got to do. To put away our immature, primitive organizing and become more serious. But whatever level of organization you are willing to participate in, get in something. 
We have to get organized. We have to study our history. We have to study the science of revolution and prepare for the future. Right. Talk about the weaknesses that's being shown. We see a rising trend of fascism. The organizations agree on that and the necessity to fight back. But we also study the history of the last, the last part of the 20th century. Then the bourgeoisie resorts to fascism when they're feeling challenged, when they're feeling threatened. Fascism rose in Germany because of the strength of the German Communist Party. It rose in Italy because of the strength of the Italian Communist Party that threatened the supremacy of the capitalist class, the imperialists. The most repressive wings of the bourgeoisie comes to power in fascism. And they snatch away the facade of bourgeois democratic rights. And what do we see? 400 um, bills introduced around the country to, steer, to make it hard for black people and other people to vote, to eliminate democratic rights. What do we see? Attack on the rights of women to control their bodies. Attack on democratic rights. An attack on black liberation movement organizations to deny us the right to self-determination. That's the fascists that are on the rise. Trump ascending and opening the, the, the gates to allow that which meant, which apparently is a significant social base, to openly voice their ideas and their practices and to storm the Capitol, and which could only be done with the complicity of members of both parties. That's right. Had those people been people of color, there would have been blood running down the stairs of the steps of the Capitol. Mm -hmm. Would have been blood. In the early days of the reportage on this question, they said that. They said that on MSNBC. Had this been Black Lives Matter, there would have been blood on the steps of the Capitol. And they stopped saying that because they don't want us to know too much truth, but we know it. <laughs> Comrades and friends, the rise of the right, but it is not just a domestic phenomenon. That's what shows that it is the whole system, imperialism led by U.S. imperialism, international colonization led by U.S. imperialism, because the right is on the rise all around the world, all around the world, and therefore our resistance must be international. We must support everybody in this country fights against the system and everybody that we can insist across the, across the waters and other parts of the world. And we have a particular responsibility to do that in that the system is led by U.S. imperialism. So we have responsibility not only to ourselves, but to our sisters and brothers and our comrades in struggle around the world. We need to be, from the belly to beast, the indigestion that causes it to die. So, we defend these upholders of the banner of socialism in the Black Liberation Movement that point to a future that serves the interests of the masses of people and not the small minority of blood suckers. We must defend these who have maintained throughout from the 60s till now the right of black people to self-determination and the right to reparations. That's right. It's a upheld organizationally, politically, and ideologically the road forward. And so these are our comrades. And we come to stand shoulder to shoulder with all those who support and defend so we said, what is to be done? Briefly, the chairman would admonish, and he has admonished us, what, what, do, what, what do we do? What is to be done? Make a revolution, first and foremost. And that's not going to happen tomorrow, but that's what must be in our minds, in all the political work that we do, that when we fight to, de to defend the democratic space, it's got to be so that people learn the weakness of the system, 
And when that he will promote, push our enemies to take back those rights, and so we know they're not sacrosanct. That sometimes they have be temporary illusions creating things in it for us. What they will want to struggle, and we will defend them through struggle. Rise Barack as a mayor of no. Do we think that being a mayor or an elected official in and of itself is freedom? No, but we have a son of revolutionary parents who himself has been raised in revolutionary struggles, who has created political space, his enabled political space. One of the first things he did was support the bringing in of whole feds to hold back the North police. And while they were kicking ass before, P.O.P. gets to exercise political speech without getting vamped on by the police. Space has been created. Democratic space has been created. And we must take advantage of it as much as we can. We must raise the demands. Hands off of Mali. Hands off African People's Socialist Party. The Democrats who will move and its allies. We must unite all the anti-imperialist forces that we can. We must unite all the forces in the black liberation movement that we can establish a black united front. We must establish unity with all anti-imperialist forces in this country to fight and in the world, to fight our common enemy and for common objectives. And so I say, in closing, long lived our comrade chairman on Wally Yeshitel, the, the African Socialist Pe People's Socialist Party, the Democratic Uhuru Movement. Long lived the struggle for the Black United Front. And as taught by Newark's, our Newark's revolutionary favorite son, Amiri Baraka. Uhuru, promotion to Tashinda. Freedom, together we shall win. Uhuru. I knew what I was doing by positioning Brother Larry Adams who I positioned. I knew what I was doing. Uh, I just want to say we got another contribution from Brother Ron, forty dollars. So here you go. Brothers and sisters, we would like to now, um, if there's anybody who just wants to come up and just uh, make a statement and show in solidarity, you're more than welcome to come up. We're going to ask that you not take up any longer than a minute. But if anybody wants to just come up and just come, come around and up. Again, we ask people to be concise just because of the time. We know that the chairman still got uh, a lot more touring to do. Yes, Brother Africa. Hey, my wife's starving, man. She just came from work. She been working all day. My daughter just down from school. The comrades back there, they've been all like, yo, we gotta go. <laughs> but I told them I'm not going nowhere but I need to speak to the ancestor, man. Hey, look. Those of us that are in this struggle that dedicate our lives to work. On the, in the grassroots, on the front line for our people. We know what you're going through. Well, we can understand. And I would forever be upset at myself or regret if I don't get to speak to you before you leave. I met you when you came last time to North, I think 2012, 13, something like that. I came. You were, you were right around the corner. Me and my family went over there. Since then, since you left, we've been still working in our community. I'm a Panther, my comrades are back there. We try to um we try to show the people do contending vows. Yes. We have our own base, we feed people weekly, See you. We, we we give our um cosmetics, yeah. we help people that's in jail, we bring their um what you call it? we bring families to go see the people there, we stand up for people that brood a lot by the post. In fact, a year ago, over like 13 months ago, the police came in front of the house and locked up four brothers. They took them to lock them because they had a white t-shirt and they had dreads. 
We went to the mayor at the Rock Rockers to demand that they let them go. They let three brothers go and they kept one for 15 months. No charges. They let them out like two weeks ago. And when they let him out, they dropped the charges down to misdemeanor. So he done spent 15 months in jail. Right. And whatever they're going to find him guilty of, because now it's a misdemeanor. He didn't do nothing. He already did the time, and like 10 times over. But this is what we're going through right here in North. North, North is, what do I, is conservative. We don't trust our politicians. I'm talking about the people on the, on the ground. We don't trust our politicians, the councilmen, the mayor, the school board. All these people have betrayed our liberation. They don't care about us. Mm -hmm. There was a report that came out about Rutgers, who owns North. Mm -hmm. They have sold over 60% of the homes mm -hmm. in the last couple of years to corporations. I can't sit here and bite my tongue and say because I know the mayor, because I supported him at one point, because of this, because of that. Now nah, it's okay what he's doing. They could give out all the dances, all the all, all the um concerts, bringing in superstars that are coming in gentrifying our community. Right. They come to give the concerts to get deals to gentrify our homes yeah. where we live at. Right. And people are sitting here acting like it's okay because a mirror rock is in power. Mm. I can't. Mm. Yo, I don't even care about being isolated. I'm already isolated. Because mm. when you speak up against these uncle times, they label you. Right now, as we speak, they, they gathering up kids in the community to go watch a movie mm -hmm. about slave traders. Mm -hmm. And they're calling them heroes in our community. Mm -hmm. They argue you down. Mm -hmm. Brother, before you leave here, because I may never get to see you again, I want to know how do we keep this fight up? They, that's our chairman back there, Chairman Chakazuma of the New African Black Panther Party. He's the one that's teaching us to create this dual contending powers to show the people that you don't need to go to them to, 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 um, to take care of yourself. But before you leave, I need to understand how do we keep the struggle going despite the Uncle Toms? Because the Congressional Black Caucus or Uncle Toms, yes. they sat there and they let them do this to you. Yes. I, I've been watching the media since they, since they came to your house. Mm -hmm. I saw you in front of the house giving a press conference. I saw you on Amy Goodman. Mm -hmm. I saw your Black Power media. Mm -hmm. I've been watching you, trying to follow you. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen not one Black elected The same one that sold people in the only tribe, whatever. I'm watching them rule our city, rule our tax down, take my money to fund and kick me out of my own city. How do I survive these niggas? Yes. That's my question, brother. Because I cannot align with them. I will never align with them. They are the traitors in our community. If you're a black panther, you're a revolutionary, and you're walking with the state, you're a traitor. Yes. I mean, like, you may feel some type of way because I said it, hey. but it is That's what it is. It is. That's right. You are a traitor to our liberation. That's right. That's right. And you That's walk right. with the government that's oppressing our people. That's yes. right. How do I survive these people without them destroying me? Because you've been here for 80 something years. That's right. I'm barely 40. I don't know if I can make it 20 more okay. with these people in power. Okay. I need to know how we survive, brother. If you can't give it to me here, Man, don't make me come down wherever you are. I can see you. I can see you. You ain't even got to I'm going to come see you. I'll follow. So, you know, I'm ready to have so much to say. But I want to get out to people because we got to be disciplined and try to be reasonable. If anybody else who wants to come up and uh, a statement of solidarity in any kind of way for an organization or individually, please feel free to do so. All right. Well, Man, I think that's, that was, go ahead. Well, I'm going to scratch your head. Oh, sure. Well, let me just, I just want to make sure I say this. Hey, I got to leave, but I want to, I'll be rude if I don't shake the chair this. I know I know I've heard you talk about how he would read your writings and everything when you were on Christmas. 
And let me state that the New African Black Panther Party, United Panther Movement, the Rainbow Coalition, the Brown Parade, stand in unity with the African Panther discussions and having uh, debates and things like that. If you're not talking about power, then I don't even know what the discussion is about. If you're talking about changing our circumstances, we have to have power. That means you have to be a self-governing people. No, nobody in the world, on the planet Earth, has ever been able to exercise power without having the capacity of self-government. And that's what colonialism does. It denies you the ability to be a self-governing people. Colonialism, by definition, is ruled by foreign and alien power. And what we have with the emergence of the colonial mode of production is that all of the political activity, all of the activity that happens with, in the world uh, happens within the context of a colonial, a, a colonial mode of production. It's not like a French colonialism or French capitalism, we're not even just talking about the policy of a particular government uh, that might establish colonialism. That has happened in the past, but that ain't, that ain't what we're talking about. We're talking about how colonialism itself has become a mode of production. And it's really important for us to understand that. One. Two, it's also important to understand that, that when you're talking about fascism, you're talking about a form of the state. Fascism is a form of the state. The state is uh, this entity of organized coercion, uh, capacity that protects the interest of an existing social system. And uh, the state is there, its purpose is coercion. 
There's no such thing as a nice state that, that's not about coercion. The question is, what social, what, what social force is the state working for? And what social force is the state working against? The emergence of colonialism as a world economy uh, means that, that the majority of peoples on the world, we live in a world where more than 80% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive of 10 US dollars or less a day. 80%, I'm talking about 99% my ass. 80% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive of 10 US dollars or less a day. 50% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive of $2.50 or less a day. And if you're in Africa, you're lucky if you can earn enough for a meal a day. That's the world that we live in because of the colonial mode of production, one. And once we begin to understand this, then we see that the state itself is an international state. The so-called capitalist state was not just born a British state. It was something that was necessary to control the world. You see various instruments that they have created for that state power. NATO is one of them, even the United Nations, one of them, and various other kinds of entities for the purpose of controlling the peoples of the world. Now, fascism is something that has come into existence because they like to talk about uh, the hidden dictatorship. Uh, people who call themselves Marxists and things like that uh, like to talk about a hidden dictatorship when it comes to uh, what they refer to uh, is a bourgeois democracy. Uh, that's why when you say something bad happening to you, white people say, well, you must have done something. They must have done something, you understand? Because it's, for them, the dictatorship is hidden. But for you, you can't stand on the corner, the pig rolls up and says, give me the corner. And you can't say nothing. Well, you exercise your right to free speech, and if you survive it, you survive it sometime on a hospital bed. This is, this is because the dictatorship for African people, for the vast majority of the world, is not hidden. There's no hidden dictatorship for the colonized. They will cut off your head. They will put a knee on your neck. They will kill your children in front of you, saying, my child, I need some help. They'll come and kill your child. This is, isn't, that how, isn't that what happens to us? There's no hidden dictatorship. In the same city that that happens in, you have right across the corner, white people telling you they must have done something. <laughs> and yes, I saw what happened after George Floyd. And yes, there, there, were, there was this inspiration that because of the struggle of African people. But when you see this, this dictatorship having to reveal itself uh, to white people, uh, because of the crisis of the social system, the crisis of colonialism. What drives the crisis? The, the capitalist system cannot function the same. Why do you have permanent warfare going on? Because of the colonizers. Who, who are they making war against? Afghanistan, Venezuela, all the oppressed people around the world who are colonized. And they're making or struggle against them because our resistance, our struggle, um, uh, deprives this parasite uh, of the host. The host uh, no longer has access to the parasite. And so it goes into a frenzy. That's what you saw on January 6th, when the white people attacked. These are the colonizers fighting each other. On January 6th, the colonizers, every one of them, the ones who are running from them and the ones who are running at them, all colonizers. These are colonizers. And so this is when you see the emergence of what you call fascism. This contest, this, this desperate state that the colonial system goes into. Look, one of the most, most, one of the most bragged about anti-fascist movements and countries was France. Wasn't that right? France fighting against Germany, fascism. But at the same time, France was fighting against Germany. What was this colonial power doing? Dominating people in Vietnam, dominating people in Algeria, dominating something like 14 different states in the continent of Africa. You can have a democratic uh, colonialism and you can have a fascist colonialism. The fact is, colonialism is colonialism is colonialism. We live under colonial domination. That's what we need to understand. That's right. You don't believe me? Check your history. People, you know, the French. Oh, French, yeah, beret word, French. <laughs> Resistance, you know, fighting against the dirty Nazi fascists and what have you. When they weren't killing Vietnamese, when they weren't killing Algerians, 
when they were killing all these African people on the continent of Africa, these anti-fascists, my ass. Fascism is when the capitalism, what you call capitalism, reveals itself to, to the colonizers in the same fashion it reveals itself or similarly to how it reveals itself to us all the time. White people want to know how to fight against this system, come and ask us. Get under the leadership of the black revolution will lead you to freedom. But this notion that somehow, and I think it's really important for us to understand that. Because I, I, they talked to uh, Cabral. Can I see the hands for me with uh, Amir Khan Cabral? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, Cabral from Guinea, what's mm. Fighting against the Portuguese colonialism. At a time where Portugal lived under fascism. And the left in Portugal was telling the comrades in Guinea that what if you fight against fascism, then colonialism was in. And Cabral said, I don't know about that, but I do know this. He could say, we don't like fascism. Cabral said, we don't like fascism. He said, well, I don't know about fighting against fascism in the colonialism, but I do know this. If we defeat colonialism, we'll, fascism will fall. It happened. It didn't happen. They beat, they beat uh, the, the Portuguese ass right. in Africa, and that made Portuguese, the white people in Portugal, were able to be free as a consequence of that. Otherwise, you find yourself fighting some battle on which side of the white group are you fighting for? I'm fighting against fascism today. Well, who is the damn fascist today? Is it Trump or Biden? That ended, didn't, didn't we hear? That Trump was supposed to be the vicious uh, fascist, a prototype for fascism. But who put 100,000 police in the streets of this country? It wasn't Trump. Biden. That's right. It was Biden and Clinton and the rest of them. So this, you know, we will be free when we get our freedom. Oh. <laughs> and that's the thing that I think is really important for us to say. When we get our freedom and we can't suffer for anything less than that, nobody should ever govern African people again except us. That's right. Second, we say that the class question is concentrated in the colonial question. You want to find the essence of the class question, look at colonialism. That's Mark right. said it. Look at That's colonialism. Right. That's right. That's where it's located. That's right. And so, comrade was asking about the Uncle Tom. I don't like to use the term Uncle Tom. The reason, not because I, 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 I don't like them, those people who characterize Uncle Tom, but you can't tell who Uncle Tom is until they do something Uncle Thomas. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying there can be a science of society that we can recognize that certain class forces will always work in their class interests. The African petty bourgeoisie as a class will always betray the revolution. That's right. Every time there was no as a class, the African petty bourgeoisie will betray the revolution. Right. Sometimes you will have individuals from the African petty bourgeoisie who can do what Cabral talked about, commit class suicide and abandon the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and unite with the interests of the African workers and peasants. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But as, as long as they're fighting, uh, as long as they function as a class, a part of that class, Fidel committed class suicide. Yeah. Che Guevara committed class suicide. Yeah. Uh, 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 people like uh, Patrice Lumumba committed class suicide. They abandoned the interests of that particular class and, and then united uh, with the class that will oppress uh, uh, workers and peasants. Walter Rodney, splendid example of uh, a uh, uh, revolutionary uh, working class intellectual. You know, so I just wanted to say that, you know, we will be free when we get free. And that's what we're going to have to fight for as a people. And ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, you ain't nothing wrong with being able to identify that we have an interest, that we are governed and ruled by foreigners and aliens, even if they exist on the same territory. It doesn't take, really, you don't have to go to school to see that. I mean, you live in the same goddamn city uh, that the colonizer lives in. Go across the street, go across the block and see how they live and see how we live. That's right. 
If your refrigerator is empty, it's not because there's no food, it's because the food in your refrigerator is in the refrigerator across town. You understand? That's just the reality of the parasitic social system. And we can't tolerate that relationship. I don't like this idea that we have to be in this room. Because if they want to, they will kill everybody in this damn room. They will kill me, like they threatened to do on July 29th. They will put me in prison forever. That's their intent. That's why this unindicted co-conspirator is, shut up, nigga. And if I don't shut up, because if I do shut up, what kind of example is that for African people? You understand what I'm saying? It ain't even about me. It's about the fact that we have to be free and we have to have the courage to stand up for black people, for Africa and for African people. If you can't do that, then get out of the game. That's what it's about. And, and so, you know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen when I walk out this door. The fact is I'm an unindicted co-conspirator according to them. The fact is they put those laser targets in my chest for a reason. They were sending me a message. I'm giving you the message they sent me. And so it ain't no secret. If I die, even if I seem to slip on a banana peel, you understand? They did it. That's right. That's right. They did it. And, and what I'm saying is this. And if they do it, and then you use the fact that they did it as an excuse not to take up your stance, take up your post, to fight against this goddamn social system until you crash it to the earth, then you will have betrayed every ancestor and then the future of our country. You have to do that. You have to do that. I appreciate y'all being here. I hope y'all join this, uh, this counteroffensive committee that we have. I hope to see everybody. We need a busload of people coming from, from Newark on November 5th. The black is back thing, we want to turn it into a response, a fight back, part of a, a demonstration of fighting back against this system, against this attack on July 29th, because that was a, a, a political attack. They're using the law to wage a political struggle we can't beat them in the courts unless we have the political forces on the ground. Let's show up on November 5th. Let's show up at least a busload coming out of Newark on November 5th. To let them know that African people see the game. We know what you're up to. We're standing strong for Africa. We're standing strong for Uhuru. You know what Uhuru means, don't you? Freedom. freedom. So we say, hands off what? Uhuru? Hands off freedom. And hands off Africa. And also, uh, I'm going to be in touch with everybody because we need to dismount as many actions as possible. And one of the things we need to do is also organize a strong, a strong demonstration and marching everything in front of that so-called 